Quand il me prend dans le bras, il a le droit tu bas, je vois la vie en rose. What the fuck are you doing? I'm making a French classic from American elements. <laughs> what? <laughs> Bonjour, or bonsoir, and welcome to another thematic episode of The Transplant Kitchen on the Paris Underground Radio Podcast Network. I'm your host, Omid Tavalai. And I am Alana McPherson Tavalai. And together we are Emperor Norton, purveyors of food from California, the American West, and the Pacific Rim. But we're making all that deliciousness for people here in lovely, chilly, and sometimes foggy lately, Paris, France. I'm absolutely loving the fall weather here in Paris. It's been cold as hell, but the autumn leaves and crisp air have been making for some beautiful cycling, making it that much more enjoyable when I deliver all of Alana's tasty baked goods to cafes around town. How are you liking it? Okay, one, this is not cold as hell as someone from almost Canada. <laughs> hey. uh, but, <laughs> but no, I, I love... This time of year, I like big cozy sweaters and cozy cafes and soon on show. Pumpkin spice. <laughs> I actually yeah. don't like pumpkin spice. <laughs> yeah, I think the whole springtime in Paris thing is overrated. It's a lie. I prefer fall anywhere we are mm. because that means Thanksgiving, like that meme goes. Get out your fat pants. Okay, but we already talked about Thanksgiving. True. And if you haven't listened to that last episode yet, shame on you, because in it we give you all the plan ahead tips for a successful turkey day abroad. But because we are freaks, we even plan our post-Thanksgiving festivities ahead of time. And so today we are talking leftovers. Leftovers are kind of a contentious topic in France, mainly because... The French aren't big on leftovers. Is that why there's so many adorable, overweight dogs in Paris? They're all getting the extra serving of mummy's boeuf bourguignon? Well, so leftovers are complicated because a long time ago, leftovers from wealthy tables were sold to poor people as food. Like, so, you could literally go and buy wealthy people's leftovers? Yes, there were people called Arlecan. And they would actually go to wealthy households and buy whatever food that they didn't eat and then resell it to poor people. What? <laughs> no fucking way. <laughs> yeah. no, so that, so that, that, that seems like such this weird, like, dystopian, upper class, lower classing. But at the same time, it makes sense. Like, yeah. in a let's not waste food kind of way, not in that this is the model society way, kind of way <laughs> where... We get the uh, the rich people's scraps, which is kind of what we do anyway, but well, and so uh, I'm some, kind of taken aback by this. Uh, and for some people, it was just a matter of survival, and it was whatever food was whatever food. For some people, it was a way to obtain food that normally they wouldn't have access to, mm. wealthy hmm. people's food. Right. Choices. It's kind of like total tangent here. There was one time I was flying from somewhere in Europe back to San Francisco when we lived in the U.S. And somebody gave me a tip that said, go up at the end of the flight, toward the end of the flight, and ask the first class flight attendants if they have any caviar left. Because if they have Iranian caviar, which was illegal in the U.S. Mm -hmm. at the time, they would have to jettison it before they come in because it's, you know, contraband in the U.S. So they were welcome to serve it to economy class passengers that asked for it. I tried once, and they said, no, we don't have any Iranian caviar, so we're not doing that. But I never got confirmation if that's true. She just said, we don't have Iranian caviar. Yeah. Maybe it's an urban legend. If somebody out there does know, I would love to know what kind of way those poor people can get the scraps of the rich, even well, today. And I would say, so I was a live-in nanny when I was in college, and when my employers would have big cocktail parties with huge trays of hors d'oeuvres, uh, there was always leftovers, just trays of food that hadn't even been unwrapped. And at the end of the evening, they would say, hey, if you want to take these to your friends. So I would show up at a townhouse full of college students with trays and trays of like tiny little canapes <laughs> and, you know, rich people's leftovers. But yep. that's in America. We love leftovers, no matter where who, who they yes. come from. <laughs> So leftovers are complicated in France because they are associated with poverty, mm -hmm. 
Um, they are also, France is very much a culture of clean your plate. Yeah. Don't waste food. Oh, I'm very familiar with that. Um, yes. And so it's also kind of rude to have leftovers because Mm. it's like you're, it's disrespectful. Really? Where it's interesting, I don't know if this is totally true, but like with Chinese dining etiquette, you're supposed to leave a little bit of everything to show that you were served enough, that they were, that the food was adequate, mm. that you weren't wanting for more. Because if you empty so the plates, yes. They were so generous, yeah. you couldn't finish. Yeah, because if you thing. empty the plates, that means that perhaps they didn't serve you enough. Okay. Anyway, that, that's what I love about cultural diversity in this world. Mm-hmm. I can actually count on one hand, actually one finger, how many coworkers I had who would bring leftovers for lunch at my old office job. Like a Tupperware or a lunchbox is called a gamelle in French, and that also happens to be the word for a dog dish. Yeah. Yeah, so my one coworker would often say, if she was asked to join a group for lunch, non, j'ai fait ma gamelle, which was often followed by the other coworkers, like, ew, face. Like, when I said it, they, oh yeah, you're American, whatever. Mm. And I, speaking of which, I was once told, you Americans, you make too much food. Which may, as I look at my gut in the mirror every morning, <laughs> be true. But as anyone with, like, Italian or Iranian or, hell, many other ethnicities, grandparents will tell you, making entirely too much food is not exclusive to Americans. It's just the way that people show generosity and conviviality. Did you have, like, a food finishing or dining policy growing up? Or did your parents make too much food? Or My mom has a bachelor's degree in home economics mm. and uh, and then went on to get a master's in early childhood ed and development and so she is very much of the everyone serves themselves their own portion of mm-hmm. food instead of being served by someone else so I was taught as a kid to take only what I could eat mm-hmm. but I was not expected to clean my plate mm. that was considered to be unhealthy and see I have an Asian mom So I got the double-edged verbal sword. You're getting fat. Now eat some more food I made so it doesn't go to waste. (laughs) Yeah. Sorry, Mom. Thank you for decades of delicious meals and for this eating complex that I have. (laughs) Well, you can't say that my family doesn't love with food, though, because I think you might recall the first time you came to my parents' house, my mom made a little bit of bacon for you. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Like two pounds. Um, Yes. For me alone. No, no, (laughs) no, no, that was for everyone. But back to the French leftover culture, the government stepped in, as it often does on this issue a few years ago, in order to combat food waste. Restaurants are now required to have to-go containers on hand, even the fine dining ones, by the way, Mm -hmm. so that you can be offered a boîte à emporter instead of uh, the waiter sneeringly saying, Vous voulez un doggy bag? It's as though the English term was being used to be extra derogatory and emphasizing the foreignness or the the filthiness of the concept. So while there may be some snobbery involved, restaurants also were concerned about takeaway items being not stored or reheated properly after they were leaving and perhaps them being saddled with some liability for customers who perhaps would take things away and not uh, care for the food and then it getting back that they got food poisoning from their leftovers from this place. Mm. See, I, I mean, not that that can't happen anywhere. But and they're not as litigious been... as Americans here, no, where they're going to like they're... sue your ass off because somebody got oh. gastro from eating. Right, but there's a was... word of mouth oh. reputation is very important. That's true. Anyway, so the, with the government, there's been a huge push for anti-gaspi, which is short for gaspillage or waste. And that's really laudable. Although we feel one way to truly combat waste is to make food so compellingly delicious that you can't help but want more, even when you're full. And to that, I say every Emperor Norton customer willingly joins the Clean Plate Club. Ugh. Or maybe not willingly, because sometimes I swear you're sprinkling weapons-grade crack into your food a lot. <laughs> what is the secret? But anyway, the whole anti-Gaspi greenwashing uh, isn't the first time that the government has stepped in here with regards to leftovers. There was something in the 19th century? Well, in 1882, public education was mandated for all children between the ages of 6 and 13. And because the majority of the children in public school were lower to lower middle income, part of that was home ec being a part of their education, the focus being on thrift and resourcefulness, including 
using leftovers. Nice. So that actually, apparently, from what I read, made it kind of in vogue to use leftovers. It became trendy. Yes. As the literacy rate of women increased due to public education, then journals with recipes and articles targeted at women started appearing, many of which had segments on using leftovers. And in the beginning, they were quite practical. There were things like using up old bread by soaking it in milk and adding egg, if that sounds kind of familiar. Mm. Un perdu, <laughs> um, or French toast, which isn't just toastier. And it's but not breakfast here. Not breakfast either. It's a dessert. It's a dessert. What a world. But as the middle class grew and the literacy rate grew, the recipes moved away from practical using up leftovers to become more and more fantastical and complicated and complex to the point where you were taking old leftover veal, for example, and doing various things to it that took four or five hours to process it into a new dish. Mm, okay, so you're still, like, not wasting a piece of veal. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, one, so one champion of the using of leftovers and helping create leftovers as a fashionable item was the chef Alfred Suzanne who wrote in 1892, 150 ways to utilize leftovers. 150 manières d'utiliser les restes. Yep. It sounds so much classier in French. <laughs> exactly. Was it classy? Have you read it? I haven't been able to find an excerpt. So, 150 ways to use Thanksgiving leftovers. Actually, you'll find way more than 150 of them on this modern thing called Google. Got your turkey tetrazzini. Turkey enchiladas, turkey and stuffing casserole, turkey gumbo, popcorn turkey, turkey kebab, pineapple turkey, lemon turkey. <laughs> There's an entire Bubba Gump turkey menu out there. Personally, I love Thanksgiving dinner as is, even as leftovers, or a sandwich made with them. Like, how can you beat a Thanksgiving sandwich? Oh no, it's Thanksgiving on a roll is like the best thing that was ever invented. And where'd you get that? Uh, when I lived in Connecticut, there was a little deli near my office that had Thanksgiving on a roll sandwiches. It was a hot sandwich, and it had turkey stuffing, gravy, cranberry sauce. But And it was a special, and they would fax you the menu in the morning, and when you found out what it was, you had to place your order right away for that, or they would sell out. See, when it's like that, I would just get it every day. They should make it every day and sell it every day, because <laughs> I would buy it every day. Well, and then, you know, they made the stuffing from scratch, so it was kind of a labor-intensive Okay. Sandwich. Oh, I get it. I think they used it to just get you hooked on their sandwiches, and then and they then just... you're coming in or waiting for their facts. Y yeah. yeah. So you're going, you're going in and getting your sandwich there every day anyway, just because they had good sandwiches. Nice. I've made my fair share of Thanksgiving burritos to take to work for a week. Those are almost as good as Thanksgiving on a roll. But what if you turned your Thanksgiving leftovers into French classics? As you're overproducing your Thanksgiving meal. Think ahead to the next overs. Oh, God. Do you like that term? You know, it's fine. I mean, I get that it's making a distinction between just plain old leftovers, which are like just a reheated plate of whatever you cooked, and transforming those into a completely different dish. Yeah. I mean, I kind of hate portmanteaus because they remind me of my corporate marketing days. But next overs are really a great way to make leftovers appealing and functional. So what defines a next over? If you're not just reheating, are you recreating an entirely new dish or are you just using your leftovers as a component in another dish? Can you make a chain where you keep going from one <laughs> meal to the next? I think I've done that, but not with the intent of doing so, but just out of necessity. I mean, for some people, when they talk about next overs, they're just talking about like you get a roast chicken and you eat some of the chicken and then you use the rest of the chicken. Like you basically you cook food with the intention of using some of it the next day or two, like not specifically for just one meal. Right. Okay. Other people I've seen write about it where they're legitimately taking food that they made, have leftovers, and 
turning it into a different dish so that they're not eating the same thing right. two days ago. Well, that's what we're going to do with our Thanksgiving leftovers. We're going to take good old American Thanksgiving and turn the leftovers into some French classics. Sound like fun? The Transplant Kitchen will be back after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to the Transplant Kitchen. Now, we don't personally do a whole lot of French cooking at home. Like, maybe we'll melt them on door or make... Some jambon beurre sandwiches for a kid. <laughs> yeah. uh, duck confit, for sure. So we All thumb- the duck. All the duck. All the duck. All the duck. I think that's a show motto. <laughs> so we thumb through Les Coffiers, which is fucking bonkers, by the way. If you want a thousand pages and over a thousand recipes worth of reading to do, check it out. And it is so not adapted to the modern kitchen. <laughs> but it, it's a good read if you're interested in food. As well as Julia Child's Mastering the Art of French Cooking to refresh our memories, which, while still a bit outdated, is definitely more approachable for American home cooks, because that's who it's made for. And maybe, among our listeners, that's what you are. Or maybe you're a French home cook. Or maybe you're a professional. But in the last episode, we talked a little about green bean casserole, how I used to hate it, and now I love it. And it's one of those leftovers I'm happy to keep eating as is. But let's put on our Escoffier hats. That would be a tall white toque, I think. (laughs) Why the fuck do people wear those? And turn it into a creamy, rich, French-style soup, which is to say, blended beyond all recognition. Why are all French soups like... I mean, there's potage, which has chunks. Right. But otherwise, when you say soup, it's like water consistency, usually. Mm, It's not water consistency, but it's... Well, there's the velouté, which is more silky, velvety. Mm -hmm. Yes. But oftentimes, if it's a vegetable soup, it's like... Pureed. Yeah. But what's without the chunks? Ice cream's like that, too. There's no... Other than Ben & Jerry's... There are no chunks in the ice cream here. Yeah. You go to Bertillon, there are no chunks in any ice cream. But it is good. Their sorbets are good. Yeah. Fuck the ice cream. <laughs> Sorry, I have opinions. Do you not like that? <laughs> yeah, I, I like chunks and stuff in my soup. And you know, I think the lack of texture is actually an old school sign of refinement because right. way back in the way back, we didn't have stick blenders and... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. like this Escoffier stuff. You're running everything through a sieve by hand to smooth it out. you're forcing it through a tummy with a spoon. Yeah. With a, you know, and multiple times, not just one time. Like, you have to keep doing it over and over again, and you start with kind of a rougher. Solid stuff. Yeah, (laughs) and you keep working your way down until you finally get that really smooth texture. There's a lot of labor. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> involved and time involved so you know i think it's from that tradition well yeah and that and that's why the french kitchen has a literal brigade of cooks to do all the dirty work yeah and it's still stuck around but now we have machines and everything so now they're just there to be yelled at and have pots and pans so oh, i'm pretty sure they're all still working <laughs> so escoffier style soup with your leftover green bean casserole you want to start with a fat knob of butter and melt it down in a soup pot If you're fancy, you can soften a minced shallot in with the butter and deglaze the pan with some white wine. We're being utilitarian here and just going on to the next step, and that's adding half a container. That's half a container here, or about 250 grams, or that would be a cup for you North Americans, of creme fraiche or sour cream. That's what you Uh, have. A petite note. Mm. Creme fraiche is higher in fat than American sour cream. Okay. Well, so... The more fat, the better. Get the <laughs> Go to Trader Joe's if you're in America and get the creme fraiche. They, they carry creme fraiche there. I do know that. Maybe they... I don't know. They change shit all the time. You can also use fresh cream, double cream, heavy cream. Use cream of some sort. Not whipped cream. Get that to a simmer and add a few cups of chicken or turkey broth or whatever you still have left for making your stuffing and gravy. Because you, you made a boatload of stock, right? That's what we recommended in the last episode. And get that simmering and add your leftover green bean casserole. Now stir that up till it's heated through because everything's already cooked at this point. If you have an immersion blender, also known as a stick blender, or I, I think it's in Dutch or German, as it says on the boxes when you buy them here in Europe because they have multiple languages, a uh, stab mixer because <laughs> you're going to stab your food. And yep. Yeah. And now it's the time to bl- blitz it all into a creamy liquefied soup. Right in the pot. If you are lucky enough to have a thermomix, because you're fancy, dump it in there, heat it up, and blitz it at full whack for about a minute and a half. That should liquefy it. Otherwise, you can cook the mixture a bit and do it in batches in a blender, returning to the soup to a pot to reheat it through. Because you probably don't want to be pouring boiling soup into most 
blender yeah. receptacles or whatever because that's how blender that's what how do you, you call cover them? Your, pitchers or spec no, it's respect. how you cover your ceiling with soup yeah mm. <laughs> and, or and sometimes they just shatter oh really yeah mm. If you're a stickler for French technique, as we mentioned, you can just pass everything through a sieve to filter out any of the remaining bits. And this is really just for finishing. You, we often do this even in, like, normal grade restaurant work. It, just to get any bits or stringy parts out, because that can happen. Then ladle it into a bowl, top it with some finely chopped parsley and chives to garnish, maybe a couple of toasted baguette slices on the side, and voila, soup au haricot vert. You can apply this technique to any of your leftovers to transform them into an Escoffier-approved soup. Even the turkey. Just be sure to use butter, cream, and a lot of stock. Add three fats to it. Then you got your soup. <laughs> Escoffier wasn't the first big-time French chef, though. Before him, in the 18th century, came Antonin Carême. He's arguably the world's first celebrity chef, if you're into that kind of thing. And there's a great biography about him called Cooking for Kings, if you want to really geek out on what it was like to cook professionally before practically any modern kitchen tools were invented. He probably didn't have any cookware endorsement deals, but he did do pop-ups around the world, or at least in Russia and England. So he was also the first chef to do pop-ups? I guess. I mean, really what it was, he was invited by royalty in Russia and England to come cook for them. But if he were alive today, he'd probably be Instagramming and saying it's a very exclusive guest chef gig <laughs> that you can't get into. His real legacy, though, is, I think, the vol au vent. In his day, this required, again, a ton of labor, probably by children, to make <laughs> laminated dough. And it implied dying early from carbon monoxide inhalation in unventilated basement kitchens with wood-burning ovens. Which actually isn't dissimilar from working in kitchens in Paris now. Luckily, you or I can just go to the supermarket and buy puff pastry in the frozen aisle, whether it's in the U.S. or France, or probably anywhere else in the Western world, for that matter. Yeah, you know, I took a class at the Escoffier Cooking School many years ago, and the instructor asked us, before we made a puff pastry-based dish, if we knew which puff pastry was the best. And all of us know-it-alls in the class replied, Well, it has to be made with pure butter. And the professor shook his head, no, 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 butter goes without saying. No, the best puff pastry is the one you buy. <laughs> Seriously? It is. The lesson, go to the supermarket. Uh, a vol au vent, which implies that it's lighter than air, which it certainly is not. I mean, I guess the structure kind of mm. is airy. Is a puff pastry crust holding a protein that's in a cream or bisque sauce, generally. Basically, a very airy pot pie. So, obviously, you're going to use your turkey and your gravy. Maybe some of your leftover vegetables. Those should be combined into, like, a soupy, stewy thing and just warmed up. In the meantime, you'll need a couple of sheets of puff pastry. If they're not already rolled out thin, you'll need to do that. Roll them out to about four to five millimeters thick. Then use a circular cutter or a knife around a pie pan or something like that. And punch out a circle about 20 centimeters in diameter. What's that in inches? Like seven or eight inches, I think. Basically a little bit bigger than a seven inch vinyl record. That's probably an outdated reference. Yeah. Twice as big around as a CD. Like that. <laughs> That's probably outdated too. Like a salad plate. A salad plate. Okay, there you go. There you go. Do this twice so you have two discs. Place one disc on a paper-lined baking sheet, and from the other disc, punch or cut out a circle a few centimeters, that's like an inch, smaller. And that's going to create a ring, and you want to put this ring on top of the first disc, and you kind of glue it on with just a little water or even like some egg wash that you brushed on or even smeared on with your fingertip. We're not doing precision work here. I actually like to use my finger more than mm -hmm. a brush because one thing you don't want is for the water or egg wash to run over the outer edges because that keeps the puff pastry from lifting up in those areas. It oh, kind of seals it so together. never mind my thing about not needing to be out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I suck at pastry. <laughs> Now, the smaller cutout is basically the lid. Some people actually put this on the existing ring and disc assembly before baking and then gently cut it off after it's finished baking. Why? I don't know. I just think it's insane. Just put it on another paper-lined baking sheet. Give it an egg wash. That's where you brush on some egg yolk with a little bit of water, right? Mm -hmm. So it gets some nice brown color when it bakes. Otherwise, it'll be the same pale as the side mm -hmm. of the puff pastry. 
You can even etch a pattern onto it with the tip of the knife, or what a lot of people do is they decorate it with any puff pastry scraps that you might have from cutting out the circles. So essentially, if you're using the scraps, are you using leftovers within a leftover dish, so it's leftover within leftover, leftover inception? Uh... So you're going to bake these parts at around 200 degrees Celsius or 400 degrees Fahrenheit for about 20 or 25 minutes or whatever is indicated on your packaged puff pastry. Because remember, we're buying the shit at the supermarket. <laughs> They'll rise up quite tall into a big, beautiful bowl and lid, which you'll hopefully do separately because you're not fucking crazy. <laughs> If you do do the lid on top, once it cools, you can take a sharp knife and, like, basically cut it back off. Because that's the thing. It's going to glue to yeah. your pastry. So you're going to have to cut it, it back off and get, risk breaking your whole damn thing. I don't get doing the work twice. It's that degree of difficulty bullshit that chefs like to do. I don't know. So to cool it off, you can put the bowl part on a serving dish and then fill it gently with your pot pie filling. Because that's what it is. Your hot Your pot hot pie. pot pie filling. And lay on the lid and take that out to the table. Voila, vol au vent du Thanksgiving. <laughs> of course, you can make these in smaller individual sizes as well. But then, fun fact, they're not called vol au vent, but bouché à la reine. And if you make them bite-sized, then they're bouché mignon. Hmm. Because size matters, apparently. <laughs> Okay, Professor Alana, let's do a little more French history by looking at our leftover mashed potatoes. We can turn that into a hachis parmentier. Is it hachis or hachis? Is the S silent? I've never known because people just call it a parmentier. And parmentier is a bit of a hero in France. There's even a Paris metro station named after him. Who the fuck was he? Antoine Augustin Parmentier got the French deep potatoes. How'd he manage that? Or what? why didn't the French eat potatoes? Um, well, because... Lots of reasons, but they thought they were poison. Mm -hmm. They thought they caused leprosy. Mm. Uh, propagating potatoes was actually illegal in France. There was a law, 1748, that it was illegal. Propagating potatoes? So like going around proselytizing about potatoes? <laughs> Growing potatoes. Have you heard of our Lord and Savior, <laughs> Potato? So you couldn't grow potatoes. You could not grow potatoes. Even for personal consumption. No. At, at most, they were animal feed, but they were, they were considered dangerous and not food for humans. So they didn't mind if animals got leprosy. <laughs> <laughs> so so how how did uh, Parmentier go around like changing that? So Parmentier was captured by the Russians during the Seven Year War, and while he was in prison, was presented with potatoes as the food to eat. So he learned that they were not poison. They did not give him leprosy. And they actually were doing a pretty good job of keeping the peasant class alive in Russia with various food scarcities going on. So he started promoting potatoes as an alternative to wheat and as a solution to food shortages. So he was gluten-free. <laughs> Way ahead of the others. Um, well, no, he just liked people having enough to eat and nutritional food to eat. That's pretty noble of him. Um, yeah. yeah. So he's kind of in France what, what George Washington Carver was to peanuts in the U.S. That is, if you grew up in a progressive enough area that they taught you about a black food scientist making peanuts a huge commodity in the U.S. Because we learned that like in the second, third grade, fourth grade. Like every year we talk about George Washington Carver. But in some schools... They never talked about the dude at all. You're shaking your head because they probably didn't in your white-ass school. <laughs> I don't remember. Sorry. White privilege. Oh, my God. <laughs> the Transplant Kitchen will be back after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to the Transplant Kitchen. Anyway, Ashi, Ashis, Hash Parmentier is named for him. And it's basically... A shepherd's pie, normally made with ground beef, whereas shepherd's pie is made with lamb, as Irish people will, like, yell at you for if you don't. Uh, some restaurateurs do it with duck and call themselves clever, which it is. It's tasty. It's delicious. Mm. It is for me the duck. only parmentier. All the duck. But we'll do it with turkey. Chop up some leftover turkey meat, simmer it in leftover gravy, place that layer in a baking dish, and evenly spoon on a layer of mashed potatoes. If you want to get freaky... And delicious, put a layer of leftover cranberry sauce between the turkey and potato layers. 
I also like to layer in whatever else is around, even though it's outside of the Parmentier canon. I mean, so it's the cranberry. Like green bean casserole, sweet potatoes. Sometimes I get really decadent and put in a layer of grated cheese. I mean, what can't be improved with a layer of cheese? You want to bake that in the oven for maybe about 15 minutes at 180 degrees Celsius, 350 Fahrenheit. Because everything is already cooked, you just want it to heat through and kind of come together into one delightful meal. But since we are trying to be fancy here, do this. Run a fork gently over the mashed potatoes to make a striped or crisscross pattern. And then drizzle some melted butter or olive oil over the top. And once your parmentier is finished cooking or really heating through, switch on the broiler for a few minutes and brown the top and that pretty pattern will emerge. Et voila, once again, parmentier à la dinde. <laughs> I think we posted a picture of this one on our Instagram recently. Uh, so check it out. It's surprisingly colorful because it's one of the ones I got a little freaky deaky with. Uh-oh. <laughs> As usual, our Instagram is at Norton of Paris. Personally, I am at Tavalai, my family name. And I'm at Hanala, my first name backwards. So please share your leftover Frankenstein anti Gaspi creations with us, or any other creations you might have gotten inspiration for. We really do love to see them. Speaking of which, we'd like to give a shout out to Emily Dilling, also known as Paris Paisan, for the warm, very soothing looking clam chowder she posted after she'd asked us for some tips on how to go about making it in France. It just looked like pure comfort. I believe the Paris Paisan podcast was the very first one we ever appeared on. Oh. And look at us now, we've got our own. Thanks for giving us our start in worldwide food media domination, Emily. Our whole audience of eight people is like, yeah, <laughs> cool, man. Speaking of which, this show is a production of Paris Underground Radio. Please check out other podcasts on the Paris Underground Radio Network by visiting parisundergroundradio.com or subscribing to and or following the channel on your favorite podcast platform, where you can also help us out by rating and reviewing us. S'il vous plaît. Merci bien, merci beaucoup, et merci mille fois, and... See you next time in The Transplant Kitchen. Bye.